Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. What a beautiful day to come and study the Lord's Word. Kind of hate to leave the book of Job. It's been such a great study. I've enjoyed it so much. But I'm really excited about starting our study on the Ten Commandments. God's law is just not a subject of importance these days. It is more important for people to battle about having tablets of stone in front of courthouses and making a big fight about that than being interested in what those stones are all about. I am reminded over and over again as I read through God's word and as I look at the struggle of the Israelites that God's word is of no use unless we allow it to go into our hearts. So I'm going to start our study this morning and looking at what the law is about. Is it necessary in Christianity today, not only is the law not talked about, but most people think that we are not under the law. Paul's words are very distorted, and people see it and take it as a license to live a life any way that they choose. And it leads to no accountability in our lives today. And so I'd like to start with the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. There is nothing like the Beatitudes to put us where we need to be, to set our feet on solid ground, to give us the attitude adjustments that we need every day. I thank God for attitude adjustments in my life just this week. How gracious is the Lord to be tender when we need tenderness and to offer a two-by-four when that is needed as well. I praise God for that. Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Now, when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, we really need to listen up extra. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices, circle that word in your Bible, and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Those are fighting words there. Can you imagine the trouble that Jesus started for himself as Pharisees that were within listening heard? these very abrasive words. I want you to know that when it says here that those that break the commandments and teach others to do the same will be called the least, it's inferring to not being there. The least are not present in the kingdom. God's not taking great Christians and not-so-great Christians to heaven. God's not really taking... Christians, he's taking sheep. So he's not taking just sort of okay sheep. He's taking only those sheep that love the Lord wholeheartedly, not those that sort of love the Lord and all those who really love the Lord. So the least in the kingdom are those that we'll be talking about that aren't present. They're the least. They didn't make it. They'll be in the fire. We cannot disregard God's law and be part of his kingdom. In fact, if we read that and really understand what he's saying, the righteousness of the Pharisees on an outward appearance 
was excellent. Just ask them. Just ask those around them. They kept the law. They were great rule keepers. They lived by the rules. And Jesus is saying, unless your righteousness surpasses that, you won't even make it into the kingdom of heaven. We need to ponder that. That's something to look at and to question. Why is Jesus saying that? Because that can be your problem and my problem. That we become Pharisees and we don't even realize that. That we are like those that are more interested in fighting for tablets to be displayed outwardly than being consumed with what's on the tablets being displayed from the inside out. And the key is called love. The key is love. What the Pharisees didn't have was love for God. So their rule-keeping meant nothing. They will be the least. They will not enter. That's what Jesus is saying. They will be the least. Our purpose on this planet is to exalt and glorify God. I'm going to say that again. Our purpose on this planet is to exalt and glorify God. And how we do that is by learning to love him and learning to love others. The royal law in us coming out. When we love God and we love others, we are exalting him. It's not just in our words. In our, God wants to hear our words of thanksgiving and praise. He inhabits the praises of his people. But how we live our lives, what we demonstrate in how we live, that is how we exalt and glorify God. Turn a couple of pages over to chapter 7, verse 12. I want to look at a few verses before we get into the meat of our study. Seven twelve. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Wow, what if that was the only rule on planet Earth and we all had to live by it and we all chose to live by it? What a different place this would be. Do to others what you would have them do to you. You know, because the reciprocal of that is found in Leviticus 24. If anyone injures his neighbor, whatever he has done must be done to him. So as you do unto others, it will be done unto you. That's God's law. Remember the law of reaping and sowing? In the end, all accounts will be settled. If we are not covered in the righteousness of Christ, we're in trouble. And God will give his sheep his righteousness because they love him. Plain and simple, because they love him. Plain and simple to do? No, it is not. Go to Romans 3. I want to talk about the law a little bit. And break it down just a little bit before we go into our Ten Commandments study. Romans 3. Verse 20. Paul talks a lot about the law. Remember, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees by his own description. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. 
If there was anyone to be an example of rule keeping, you looked up his name. He was the best of the best rule keepers. But he discovered that he didn't love God. He loved keeping rules. That's called being a religious zealot. That is worshiping the rules. We're go our study of the Ten Commandments is going to take us to who or what we are worshiping. Understanding that God is love and that we are being conformed to his image of love and to understand that we are under the two great laws of love, love God and love others. The Ten Commandments is a definition of what that looks like. It is a very um, basic understanding that covers everything that there is, but there is a lot more. Being transformed into the image of Christ means becoming unselfish. It means being changed in the attitude of our minds, how we think, how we act. It involves everything. But the law, we need to understand our relationship to the law because the law doesn't save us. The Pharisees kept the law because they thought that their, their righteousness came from obedience to the law. Therefore, I am saved and I am great and I am wonderful because I keep the law. And you and I can walk that path too. Without love, we become Pharisees. We become rule keepers. The, other, the flip side of that is that we believe we're not under the law, so we can live however we want because we've said the salvation prayer somewhere along life's journey, and we're in. And there is no accountability when the law is not there. The law doesn't save us. Christ saves us. But the law defines what love is and what love is not. And if we want to be transformed into the image of Christ because we are carnal beings, we need a definition. Otherwise, we make up our own definitions. Even with definitions, we want to tweak God's definitions. So let's see what Paul says about the law. And I'm starting in the New Testament because there are so many people that are lost in their understanding about the Ten Commandments because they've taken Paul's writings and distorted them and given themselves a license to be free from obedience. And Revelation's story defines God's people as those who keep the commandments. If you've never read that, I urge you this afternoon to go into Revelation and go and read chapter 12 and chapter 14, two places where God calls and defines his people as those who keep the commandments. Important for you and I to know that we keep the commandments, but what is the motivation for keeping the commandments? That's what you and I need to, to ask ourselves. Are we motivated to keep them because we're afraid of going to hell if we don't? Are we motivated to keep them because we have a relationship with God and we want to please God. We want to do what is right. We want to do what is loving. And this is what God says is loving. And God says is not loving. And our motivation is our relationship with our creator. Paul says in this verse, verse 20, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Remember, he says in, in chapter 7, I wouldn't have known what covetousness was if the law didn't say that. Think about traffic um, speed limits. If the speed limit says 55 and I'm going 56, what does that make me? Makes me a lawbreaker. I am speeding according to the law. The law simply defines 
That's, that speed sign defines the law. That is what God's word does in, in, in the Ten Commandments. It defines what the law is. You and I decide what relationship we're going to have with the law. And what relationship we have with God determines what our relationship with the law is. If we are not having a saving personal relationship with God, we will keep the commandments and become Pharisees. Void of love. Because we're going to come to find out that there is, as we go through this study over the next, it'll take us several weeks to go through all of the commandments, we're going to get a fresh look, I hope, at what God is expecting from us, what he is wanting us to see, each one of us, as to our relationship with him and our relationship to how we keep the law and what, why the law has been, every generation buries the law deeper and deeper and deeper. And we have a culture of Christians that consider worship Something that you do briefly for a few hours a, day, a week. That's worship. You show up to church whenever the church service is, and that's what worship is. It's tragic. And God, during the Great Tribulation, and you know, my entire mission in, what, in teaching the Word is helping us to understand our relationship as the last generation, how these things fit for us, what they should mean to us. As the final generation, these things should matter everything to us in our relationship with God. The definition of who God's sheep are is that they keep the commandments. What is this God? What am I doing or not doing that is pleasing you, displeasing you? I want to please you more than anything. I want to be right with you. And we've learned from the, our, our study on the book of Job that he was a blameless man. The Bible never says he was sinless. That's impossible. You and I can't keep the commandments. Even those that think they keep them, they're not keeping them. Just by thinking that they're keeping them, they're lying, that they're not keeping them. Lying made the top ten. Even if we're just lying to ourselves, God still sees it, still written down. So it's so important that we look at this and ask the Holy Spirit to give us deeper understanding. We can never go into any study thinking we already know what there is to know. The Lord is always wanting to reveal himself in a deeper, grander way. That he becomes bigger. The bigger that God is in our eyes and in our minds, the smaller that we are. You know what a gift it is to be small in your own eyes? Humility, to be small in our own eyes, because God is so big we can't hardly see ourselves, that is a gift. That is a fantastic gift that the Spirit will give us if we want it. That we, it's called being consumed and captivated with God, and that I matter less and less. Even though God values me and treasures me, and I really love the song, that wretches become treasures. That's just that morning. That really spoke to me this morning. His love is beyond, beyond. What he wants to do with beings that are carnal are, what he's going to do with us is going to be a sight to behold that God will take out our carnal natures and fit us with his nature, that you and I will not have one evil thought, not one, not one selfish thought when that day comes. And that gift will be given to all those who love God. Not that, and I want, I want to make this clear because this subject can be like, uh, panic, I'm so selfish. You know, when you start, look, when you see God in a bigger way and you exalt him and you see sin clearly and you see yourself clearly, it's overwhelming. It makes you want to sit and cry for days. It makes you just want to sit and cry for days. You are so great and look at me and you, and you want me and you love me, Lord. How can this be? 
I don't understand this kind of love. I don't understand your greatness. I don't understand that kind of majesty. I don't understand the mighty hand that you're willing to have over my life. And so looking at what the law is and how God lives and the definition of love is something that we need. We need to be looking at on a regular basis. And we're going to look to see what God has to say and reveal to us in this journey of the Ten Commandments. Look at 3.31, just a few more verses from where we were. And reading the book of Romans is a, a good read for anybody that we're going through the law. But I want you to just mark this one. Do we then nullify the law because we are made righteous by faith? No, not at all. We uphold the law. That verse gets lost. That verse gets glossed over. We uphold the law. We uphold it. We value what God says do and don't do. We value. We trust God. We can't do it. We can't keep the law. But by God's power, we can. By God's power, we can overcome minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. We don't need to be, try to become overwhelmed that how am I going to keep the law forever? We can't. But God looks to see if we love him so much that we want to keep the law perfectly. Because we don't want to hurt God. When we are defiant and rebellious, it hurts God's heart. Last night, we were, um, one of our little four-year-old friends was with us. Well, he's five now. I shouldn't say that. Have you heard me say that? And we've been studying. Um, most of you know I'm a preschool teacher. And we were studying about creation week and about how sin entered the world and how uh, when one of the good angels became very, very bad and he hates God. And he said, and that really hurt God's heart. And I was like, <sighs> for a little one to say that, it's like, yeah, how often do we hurt God's heart in our attitudes, in the things that we do, how we react instead of responding in love, we react in selfishness? It's like, Lord. So we are to uphold the law, to say, God, what you have said, set these rules in place for our good. And we want to live according to your boundaries because that is love. Otherwise, you and I, well, we'll make our own boundaries. We'll define what love is. Like in today's world, live together. Because if you love together, that's all that matters. Well, that pretty much dilutes love in every way, shape, and form and makes a mockery of what God says love is. But if we are in the world not accepting and not looking at how God wants us to live, we will adopt the ways of the world. The world is constantly trying to make its way into our hearts and to push out, to interfere with what the Spirit is doing in our lives so that it consumes us. The enemy wants to make a Sodom and Gomorrah out of our hearts. If it's just one piece, one day at a time, if he can put it in there, eventually, if we do not allow the Spirit to clean house on a regular basis, that is who we will become, like Egypt and Sodom. Egypt, hardness of heart, Sodom and Gomorrah, totally desecrating God's law in every way. We will become that. It's not if we will become a goat like Lucifer who will have to be destroyed because there is no rehabilitation for sin. Taking a look at the Ten Commandments and understanding where God is coming from and how he wants for us to live is saying, Lord, I want to value what you value. I want to uphold your law because God's law, if you haven't been to one of the prophecy studies, 
if you don't know that the law is one of the two witnesses. Yes, one of the two witnesses. You and I need to know that. We are accountable to God for how we live, and the law stands. The law has no power to save and no power to condemn. It just stands there like that, that, like that sign that says 55. Were you going 55 or under, or were you going over, Letty? Which is it? Plain and simple. The facts. Nothing but the facts. So the law stands there, and we line up. That is God's plumb line. How do we line up according to the law? And of course, the grander law is loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. See, it's so much more than Ten Commandments. But Ten Commandments define what that love looks like. Look at Romans 7. 7. Paul's very candid um, conversation about struggling with sin. And he says, is, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. I would not have known what sin was except through the law. That's the purpose for it. God defines, us, defines it. Look at um, 8, 7. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. I want you to note that Paul is saying that a sinful mind cannot submit to God's law, meaning that we are supposed to submit to God's law. It is required that we submit ourselves to God's law. But if we are controlled by the sinful nature, we cannot do it. Now, you and I are to be controlled by the Spirit. We are con- doesn't mean we're going to live a sinless life. It means that we can live a blameless life. We're not controlled by the carnal nature. And when the carnal nature gets the better of us, we make things right so that we remain blameless in God's sight because we want to have that incredible attitude that the spirit built in Job. The need to just to be right with God. I don't want to be one, off one eeny weeny grain of sand bit off of the road with God. I want to be on the road with the Lord in every way. And Paul has the same heart that Job did. He wants to be right with God. He can't stand that sin's reigning within him. He goes, he wants to do good and he does the opposite. He wants to have a good attitude, and he doesn't. And he's just, ugh. And when I was reading that this morning, what a wretched man I am, and that song this morning was like, ugh. Wretched people that God loves. How awesome is that? The righteous requirements that you and I have to have to be part of God's kingdom are met in Jesus Christ. That's what Romans 8 is about. The righteous requirements that the law demands. I want to remind you that God doesn't say, I'm going to give you 10 suggestions for living a nice, how to have your best life. He is saying, these are 10 commandments. I command you to do these things. Jesus lived those righteous requirements. The creator of the universe lived the righteous requirements necessary for you and I to be part of heaven and part of his family. And he gives us that righteousness. Wow. Does that not just blow your mind again this morning? That blows my mind. The wisest man that ever lived says one very profound thing Well, he says several, but one that we need to definitely circle in our Bibles. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. 